I'm François Blavout. I work as an Android engineer uh, at uh, Deezer. So in case you don't know Deezer, uh, it's a music streaming application. Uh, so we have a very complex uh, audio engine, but uh, we are not going to talk about it today. Uh, because uh, in order to uh, play music, we also have a very deep uh, UI requirements. Uh, for example, we need to be able uh, to display uh, lyrics, uh, make them scroll on the highlight, uh, uh, display an album screen uh, with a picture of uh, the artist, uh, very complex uh, track views, and so on. Uh, we even have a Tinder-like uh, view uh, for the onboarding process in order to let you choose uh, your first uh, album and artist. Um, and uh, last year, I have been involved uh, in a complete, complete uh, rewrite uh, of uh, the UI. Uh, so we basically throw everything away uh, and uh, pushed uh, material instead. Uh, it was a very good opportunity. So we, we made uh, many changes. Uh, we dumped uh, child uh, fragments because it's a very bad API. Uh, we replaced uh, this view with recycler view since uh, there are many more possibilities in terms of animations. Uh, and we have also tried uh, to focus on uh, performances uh, in UI. Uh, in particular, uh, layouting. Uh, it's uh, one of the common bottlenecks of the platform. Uh, on Android, uh, we are still not able uh, to have uh, smooth uh, scrolling in lists. Uh, even uh, now, it's a problem uh, that is not solved. Uh, however, uh, if we look at uh, the material spec, uh, one very important aspect uh, is that uh, motion uh, is uh, providing a meaning. Uh, for example, if you have a mail application and you delete a mail, uh, you make it swipe and uh, the rest of the list uh, moves up uh, it's a very tactile uh, experience, uh, and since we are using our finger on the screen, uh, it's something that is very natural. Uh, however, uh, if uh, the world experience is junky, uh, it is not at all natural. So, if we take, uh, for example, uh, a contact application uh, from the material spec, um, we can see uh, things uh, moving uh, with a finger very naturally. So it's running on a Nexus 6P, one of the best phones right now. Uh, everything follows the finger. Nothing uh, blinks in and out of existence. Uh, if I take uh, the same application uh, on another phone, uh, it's not that great. Um, and the problem is uh, that most of our users don't have Nexus 6P. Uh, they have something like this. So it's a uh, Galaxy Fame, uh, it's a popular phone, it ships uh, with uh, 4.2 Jelly Bean, so it's something that uh, most of us are probably supporting. Um, to be honest, uh, it's probably the lower bound of uh, what we support. Uh, it's a very weak phone. Uh, it's not possible to have a perfectly smooth experience on something like this. Um, but First, we can make things better, make them acceptable. And secondly, uh, there is a wide spectrum of devices. And uh, for example, we have the Moto G. Uh, it's a mid-range uh, device. It is uh, not great, but it's not too bad either. And uh, with some efforts, uh, we can have a smooth experience on uh, these phones. And uh, if you look at uh, your usage stats, uh, the Moto G is probably here somewhere in the top 10 along with uh, other uh, not that great devices. Uh, so what we are going to do uh, is uh, investigate uh, what is going on exactly, uh, why uh, don't we have uh, good performances, and what we can do about it. So first, uh, let's define exactly uh, what we mean uh, by good performances. So we often are uh, talking about the 16 millisecond target. Uh, it's simply because uh, if you take uh, one second and uh, divide, in, uh, divide it in uh, 60, uh, you get 16.7. You get, uh, uh, so we are trying to display 60 frames each second. Um, 
Why? Uh, quite simply because, well, it's a trick. Uh, there is no motion on the screen, it's just a succession of images, and we just need to make them fast enough uh, in order to trick a human vision. So if we look at uh, other applications, uh, the movies are an interesting one since it's uh, very low, uh, 24 frames per second, and originally it was even 16 frames per second. Uh, well, it's a uh, very uh, down to earth uh, reason. Uh, it's just that uh, originally a film was uh, very costly, so they took uh, the lowest boon of uh, what uh, they could get away with. Uh, and it stays that way until now. So we can go as low as 20 frames per second at the limit. Uh, under that, uh, people are starting to notice uh, that uh, just uh, images one after the other. Uh, video games is another example uh, where uh, um, you can see uh, huge differences in uh, frame rate. And uh, usually, uh, games uh, target 30, 60, or even more frames per second. And uh, in uh, games or uh, mobile application, uh, if we, you can miss a frame or two, it's not too bad. Uh, but if you start missing more frames, uh, you drop for a moment under uh, 30 or 20 frames per second, and you get junk. So junk is a discontinuity of motion, and uh, simply uh, you are not able to display enough frames. Uh, let's investigate why we have this issue. So uh, the SDK is uh, giving us a very nice tool, SysTrace. Uh, it allows to display uh, everything, basically, that happens uh, on, the, on all the system processes. Um, what we are going to do is take an application, make it scroll, see that it is junky, and uh, ask SysTrace uh, to output uh, a report. What we get is uh, this very intimidating uh, web page. Uh, it's actually very useful. So what we have uh, is a representation of uh, everything that happens. And uh, if you look at the little f uh, in the middle of the screen, uh, it is uh, just uh, the system trying to display a frame. And it's appearing in red each time uh, we miss one. And if we zoom in, uh, we can uh, so we can see a missed frame, and we can see for uh, this particular frame, well, we are simply uh, performing a traversal on draw, uh, so layouting on the draw operations that are just too long, and it made us uh, miss a frame. And by the way, if you miss a frame, you are not going to hit uh, 17 or 18 uh, milliseconds. The system will wait uh, for the next uh, frame. So it's going to be 32 or even more uh, milliseconds before you can uh, display anything else. So that's why uh, very quickly uh, a long uh, draw or layouting operation uh, tends to accumulate and uh, makes the whole experience uh, um, very unsatisfactory. Um, this twice is a very complex tool and uh, until uh, quite not Quite recently, uh, you had to spend a lot of time uh, in order to investigate uh, what was going on uh, for many frames in order to identify a culprit. Uh, fortunately, in many cases, you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, you can get uh, some advice uh, directly from the tool. Uh, so if you look at this report, uh, we got uh, some uh, expensive bitmap uploads. Well, can't do a lot of things about it. Uh, uh, just use uh, Glide, Picasso, whatever works for you. You will always have uh, some expensive bitmaps, and most of the time it's not a, a big issue. Uh, some uh, costly uh, draw operation, well, uh, if that's uh, your issue, uh, you need to go back in time and uh, uh, listen to the flat as a pancake uh, talk. Um, some inefficient uh, alpha usage. Well, alpha uh, transparency is uh, always costly on Android. Um, it's not well supported by all terminals, so it's often an issue. Uh, so if you can avoid uh, using alpha and get the same rendering, do it. Uh, and finally, uh, in our cases, uh, expensive measure layout pass. So we have layouting issues uh, that prevent us from uh, getting uh, 60 frames per second. Good. 
the next step is to measure uh, layouting performances in order to know exactly where the problem is coming from. Uh, in order to do that, uh, the platform provides uh, ARK viewer. Um, so what it does is that it allows you to display uh, the whole uh, ARK. So Android, uh, like uh, most uh, other UI framework, uh, display layouts uh, as uh, boxes in boxes in other boxes and so on. So you build a tree of uh, views, one into the other. So on the left, uh, you've got uh, the road view, and uh, at the very right, uh, the tip of the tree. Um, so uh, according to Chet Az, I learned that uh, during the previous talk, uh, you should not use the Yarky viewer. So it's nowhere in the documentation. It's uh, unofficial right now. It's probably going to change. So Yarky viewer allows you to get some information on uh, how uh, each node is performing relatively. That's, uh, it's not too accurate. Um, so what you can do instead, it's a bit painful, um, but uh, and I hope that the platform will provide it uh, as in uh, in the uh, next release, is uh, just um, create your own layout inflator, replace uh, relative layout, linear layout, uh, on all uh, the platform uh, view groups. Uh, by custom cases where you add some logging uh, in order to identify where you have a layouting issue. Um, that way, uh, you can identify exactly what part of uh, your view hierarchy is uh, dragging you down because you don't want to uh, optimize everything. Uh, you don't have the time. Uh, you have a feature to chip uh, like uh, everybody else. So just focus on where you really you have a bottleneck. Um, so let's dive a little bit uh, in the code in order to understand uh, why we have uh, these uh, issues uh, with uh, view groups. So there are two uh, main methods uh, in view group, uh, on measure and on layout. So on measure uh, is basically here uh, um, in order to make uh, the view group measure, well, first itself and secondly, each of his children. And uh, so you just have to do that in order to satisfy the contracts of the platform. And on layout, where you just have uh, to say to each of uh, the children uh, where they are going to go exactly. Um, if we look at uh, relative layout, um, at its core, uh, it is designed uh, around uh, collecting and applying constraints. So it uh, collects uh, rules uh, for vertical placement, so above, below, aligned baseline, aligned top, and so on. Uh, for horizontal placement as well, so uh, left off, right off, uh, start, end, uh, and so on. And what it does exactly uh, in order to apply all these constraints that you are going to put uh, in your XML uh, is that in its own measure call, it's going to sort all of its children according to their relative constraint. Um, then apply the horizontal constraint, apply the vertical constraint, and then apply everything that is left, uh, so baseline, size wrapping, right to left, and so on. Uh, in order to do so, uh, relative layout needs uh, two passes in all measure. Uh, so first to collect, then to apply. And that's why uh, it's going to be costly. So one relative layout is not an issue, but when you start having a relative layout nested in another relative layout, nested in another relative layout, well, this uh, double pass uh, um, accumulates, and uh, you got two, four, eight, it's uh, geometrical, and uh, very quickly it becomes too costly. So don't use relative layout uh, if you can as the root of your uh, view hierarchy. Um, but by all means, use relative layouts when you need it. Uh, it is costly when you need to nest it, but uh, if it is not uh, uh, creating a performance problem, uh, it is still an awesome class uh, that allows you to create uh, uh, the layouts you need. It's just that you need to know that it can very quickly become costly. Uh, what about the other classes of the platform? Linear layout is simpler, except if you need to apply a weight since uh, a weight is, after all, another relative uh, constraint. Well, 
In that case, linear layout also needs uh, to do two passes. And same thing, if you nest uh, relative constraints, it is costly. Uh, in fact, anything uh, relative, so percentage, weight, uh, relative, uh, is going uh, to become a performance problem if you nest. Um, so, uh, what are the solutions? Well, first, uh, avoid nesting uh, layout uh, view group, sorry, as much as possible. Um, use as few view as possible, so you can use computables, spanables uh, for uh, text views. Uh, you can pick the right view group, uh, maybe uh, uh, relative layout or linear layout uh, or grid, uh, depending on your use case. Um, but still, uh, if you do that and uh, you still don't have the performances uh, you want, and, well, you want to make your designer happy, so you want to make uh, their awesome design, well, one potential solution uh, is to throw away uh, the platform classes and write your own. So uh, framework classes uh, like uh, relative layouts uh, have uh, three priorities. So first, be correct, apply all uh, your specification. Uh, be versatile, uh, be able to handle everything above, uh, under, below, align top, and so on. And only third, performances, uh, as much as is possible uh, while respecting the two first. So what we can do uh, with a custom view group is forget about versatility. We want to do something specific, and that way uh, we can still be correct and, and have the best performances we can uh, for the uh, specific arrangement of views. Uh, so we are going to take uh, this as an example. So it's a simple album view. Uh, it's not the worst view in the world. Uh, in practice, most problematic layouts uh, will be more complex than that. Uh, but this allows uh, to show how layouting works without repeating too much code and uh, show a couple of uh, potential issues. So. Uh, if I had to do this layout uh, with the front classes, it would uh, look something like this. Uh, relative layout uh, with an image view uh, on uh, the left, or um, start. Uh, two other image view uh, on the end, uh, uh, with uh, the earth uh, uh, on the start uh, of uh, the overflow. And then uh, linear layout uh, for the two text view I need, or uh, maybe a spanable if it uh, works. Um, and I'm going to forget about it and replace a uh, relative layout with a custom view. So I'm going to keep uh, width, height, and padding directly in the XLL because I don't want to get rid of that. And uh, I could make everything in code, but uh, it's a good thing to keep as much uh, specification, uh, layouting specification as possible directly in the XML because you don't want to have an enormous uh, custom class where you, where it's impossible to maintain anything. And I'm going to inflate uh, the XML uh, normally, uh, as I would do uh, with uh, the relative layout one. Then, um, let's start uh, writing uh, this class. So, uh, we declare an album view, text on the directly view group. Um, constructor not very interesting. Uh, the only interesting thing is that uh, we call an init method. Uh, in it, uh, we inflate a second layout. And in there, uh, we are just going to make a merge uh, with the different views we need. Um, I could have uh, directly uh, replaced relative layout with album view in one XML. Um, I'm not uh, really fond of that because it will mean uh, that I always need to use uh, the album view class with an exact XML, the exact same XML. So it's, uh, I don't, it's not very good uh, for maintainability to couple uh, uh, layout on, on the classes that way. Uh, instead, I just inflate it uh, in the constructor, uh, in the init uh, method called by the constructor. And if I need uh, more uh, versatility, I can extend on the um, call uh, different layouting, li different uh, layout uh, depending on the cases. Um, I get directly uh, the different uh, children uh, with uh, find view by ID, so what we will do uh, in all cases. 
Uh, then, uh, in order to write a uh, view group, uh, I also need to declare uh, which uh, layout params uh, we want to use. So, in almost all cases, uh, it's not the default of the platform, maybe it should be, uh, you want uh, to use a margin layout because you want to be able to apply margins uh, to our children. Uh, so, you just need to declare it in these two methods. So, the first one uh, is called uh, each time you inflate a view in XML. And the second one is called uh, when you create a view directly by the constructor. So it just uh, supplies the default uh, layout params in that case. So uh, let's get to the meat of uh, view group. Uh, the first thing uh, you need to do in a measure layout pass, well, it's measuring the views. So in the on measure callback, uh, all we have to do is uh, take each children measure it, uh, count uh, how much uh, space uh, we are occupying, and then declare it. So let's do it for a first view. Uh, we just have to call measure child uh, with margin, so it's a framework method. And uh, it's very straightforward, so the first argument is a child. Uh, the second, uh, the width the measure spec uh, that is provided uh, by the method. Uh, the third one, the width uh, use so far, so since it's the first view, uh, it's zero. Uh, then, uh, same thing for the height. And once we are done, uh, we are going to count uh, how much width uh, we have used. Uh, then, we just repeat that for uh, each of our children. Uh, so, let's do it for the overflow. Uh, and we call the exact uh, same method, uh, just change the overflow, and same thing, we count how much width uh, we are using. Uh, I'm not counting uh, the height, uh, by the way, uh, because uh, uh, I don't need to for this uh, simple view, uh, where I know that uh, the height is constant. Uh, if you have a more complex uh, view with uh, different layers, uh, you will need uh, to count it uh, separately, but it's uh, very repetitive and not very interesting to display. Uh, so we just uh, call a measure a child with margin on half of our children. And then, uh, in order to satisfy the contract of uh, all measure, uh, we call set measure dimensions, uh, which allows uh, the framework to know uh, and resolve the dimension of the view. And uh, again, we have uh, framework method in order to help us. So resolve size uh, allow us uh, to give uh, the width we have used, the width the measure spec uh, provided uh, by the method, and let the framework uh, handle how it resolves and uh, what it's going to, to be. So for example, here we are using match parent. So uh, it is just uh, going to be uh, whatever uh, width uh, we have for this view. And uh, for the height, I uh, don't even bother since I know it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a dimension uh, directly given in the XML. I just get the size. And again, it, it uh, might vary in uh, your own view. Um, that's it. We have done uh, the measure pass. Now we need to do the layouting one. Um, it's, uh, again, a bit repetitive and uh, not that complex, even if it can be intimidating at first. Uh, for each of our children, we are going to call a layout view, again, a, a framework method, uh, and it just declares uh, to the child where it needs to go. So the first argument uh, is a view to layout. And then, um, um, you need to give it uh, its uh, left position, its top position, and uh, its uh, width and height. So I just uh, made a little helper method in order to apply as well the margins, since uh, you want to keep them. Um, and we are going to do this for each child. And for overflow, so we are directly on the right. So we need to take the right uh, border remove the left, since uh, what we get uh, in the own layout are the absolute uh, position of, of uh, the view. So in order to, in layout, uh, give a relative, uh, dimension, relative position to the children, uh, we need to do some uh, simple operation. So in order to get to the right, 
uh, we need to do right, minus left, uh, minus the padding, uh, minus uh, the width of the view. Okay, we are directly where we want to be. Uh, I want to center the view, so same thing, I need the height, so it's bottom uh, minus top. Uh, I need to remove the height and divide by two in order to center. It's uh, not that complicated. Uh, and, uh, and finally, in order to lay out, I need to tell the view uh, how much uh, width and height uh, it has. So uh, I just uh, need to go uh, get mother width since that's already been done in the mother pass. And the result, and once we have done that for each view, is the exact same disposition uh, we had uh, for uh, uh, the relative layout uh, implementation. But this time we are flat, we don't have any nesting, and uh, we get pretty much uh, the optimal measure on layout performances we can have on the platform. Um, that way, uh, we had the bottleneck, and we have gone as uh, fast as possible, so hopefully it's enough. It, if it is not, well, let's go back to measuring our performances and uh, optimize another view. And uh, at the end of the day, it should be enough uh, to get uh, relatively smooth uh, scrolling even on the low end devices. So what now? Uh, I have done that, a uh, couple of months uh, pass. Uh, I want to be able to keep these performances um, again, we have a nice tool directly in the framework, uh, GFX Info. Uh, so it's a shell command, and it allows us to get uh, um, a report of uh, what happened uh, just earlier uh, in terms of frames. And what we get, uh, for example, is uh, how many uh, uh, junky frames we had on uh, their percentage. So it's uh, quite easy to create uh, an espresso test, uh, make it uh, scroll uh, in a list, and then make a GFX info run, uh, make a report, collect the values, and if uh, after uh, two months, uh, suddenly you have a new commit and uh, it ruins your scrolling, that way you can directly be notified. So it can be extremely useful. The only uh, big downside of uh, this tool is that uh, it is only available on a terminal running Marshmallow on up. So you need to find a low middle end Marshmallow device in order to make it work. Uh, to conclude, um, writing your own view group uh, is a trade-off. Uh, you are going to spend a bit more time, not that much, but a bit more, uh, writing uh, code directly in Java instead of XML. Um, on the other hand, you get uh, performances, and you also get uh, customization possibilities that you simply don't have on the platform. If you want to display view on a circle, well, you don't have a class for that in the platform, but you can simply uh, write your own. So you really need to find a balance uh, between uh, these three things, performances, customization, versus the time you have to ship features. Um, if you are interested uh, by uh, these problems, um, these are hiring, so don't hesitate to contact us. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs> so when you did the out, uh, what kind of percentage you Sorry, don't get you. Yeah. What kind of well, um, so, so in percentage of uh, junky frames, um, again, uh, the big problem is that uh, we can only use uh, GFX info uh, for recent devices, so not on something like a Galaxy frame. Uh, but uh, and it's important to be able to measure that because uh, if you just uh, do it uh, yourself, um, from one engineer to the other, you don't have uh, the same feelings uh, as far as performances go, uh, but we get, uh, we go for something like uh, seven, eight percent of a drop frame, which is way too much, to one or two, which is uh, generally smooth uh, scrolling. Thank you.